Yes, my name is Lorenzo Colitti. I've been involved at, um, in the um, IP6 efforts at Google since you know, for quite a while now, since the beginning. Um, I've never really, uh, many of you may have seen this before, I've never um, talked about it at Nanog. Um, so I'd like to share um, some general information about IP6 at Google and then focus later on on um, one of the big problems that we see at the moment, which is uh, IPv6 brokenness in the internet and how that sort of uh, impedes our ability to actually deliver v6 content. So um, why, why is it that we started in 2007, actually, to do IPv6? Um, well, everyone's seen this graph. Um, the writing's on the wall for v4. Um, we started, I mean, in 2000, we had 50% of the address free. Now we have the beginning. We had 10% of, of, of address space free. Um, and now we have 6%. So yeah. There we are, the image finally loaded. Um, so um, V4, the writing's on the wall for V4, okay? So, um, so what, what happens after that? Well, you buy addresses or you NAT or you uh, do V6. Um, if NATing is gonna be expensive, um, you'll need, the box is gonna be expensive. You're gonna have to log every session that passes through them. You can use compression to, to reduce that, but you, it, it, it ends up being of the order of terabytes a month for every, for every million subscribers. Um, of course, the network NAT is complex and it's it's hard to manage. Um, from the perspective of a content provider, what's more interesting is that the semantics of an IP address become blurred. Um, you can't assume that a um, that an IP address is is an individual user. You can't geolocate uh, as well, <clears throat> and that impacts your your ability to give, for example, streaming with fine-grained geolocation restrictions. Uh, you can't uh, identify abuse and mitigate abuse because if you um, if you block an IP address, you might be blocking 100 users and taking out uh, those users as collateral damage. Um, then there's port exhaustion problems when when some uh, user is behind. Um, <clears throat> a carrier grade NAT and has a virus that's opening all the ports and e exhausting all the state on the NAT, what's gonna happen is that the NAT has to, has to um, warn the user. And um, the current spe specifications in the broadband forum say um, that this should be done using HTTP intercept. So um, the, your connection to Google will be, or, or to anywhere else will be intercepted and you'll get this helpful page saying, you have run out of ports, please click here to fix the problem or please contact your SP. And of course, we're thrilled to have that content uh, replaced, uh, our content replaced by messages like that. And there's things like IP authentication, and nobody does that, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, new devices, um, there's set-top boxes. Um, a lot of them just simply can't be numbered out of V4 space because there is no V4 space. Uh, mobile networks, we actually had a, um, a, an implementers meeting last week at, uh, on, on Google campus, and. Um, Verizon and T-Mobile were there, and for them, it, it's, it's basically they've already run out of V4. They're saying that there's no, no more V4. They have, I think, multiple overlapping Net10 spaces, Bogon space, and, 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 and that's very hard to manage. So <clears throat> if you want to talk to these devices, you'd better have IPv6, because uh, and if you don't, they'll do it for you, right? They'll put a NAT64 in place. I think T-Mobile has gone on the record as saying this multiple times. They will do NAT64, so if your services uh, so if you want to, if you want to, you know, provide better, better service, you'd better be available over v6. Um, n new applications. I mean, really, um, IP6 is, is is the only way to to keep to, to maintain the current architecture of, of the internet uh, as we know it. So, <clears throat> what have we done? So we, we started in in uh, 2007 as a 20% project. You know, this is one of the nice things about Google is you get to start on working on whatever you like. Um, and then people just came out of the woodwork to help. Um, how can I make my service available over V6? How can I help? Um, we started with a small, a small scale lab network and then we just scaled it up. A pilot is not expensive and then once, once the network is there, the applications will follow. Because to the, to the software, to the, to the applications, it's just another packet, right? So we did it in stages. So you, V6 doesn't need to be as capable as V4 on day one just because the traffic isn't there. Uh, but it has to be done properly because if it's not production quality, then it's no use to anyone. And we folded into our normal upgrade cycles. One of the reasons why it took YouTube to, you know, so long to be available over V6 is that the hardware that we had was not capable of doing IPv6 in hardware. Um, so how did we do it? A little bit more from the software side. So we, we took the approach that, you know, since, since what we needed to, to make available first were user services, and since 
Um, there was so little traffic, and still is, it's, it's about 0.1%. What happened is we started from the outside and we moved in. We started the load balancer, then we moved to the front end, then we moved to the web server, and then we went back towards the back end. And, and, and if you're a content provider, there are some parts of the network that will never need to see an IPv6 packet you know, for years. Um, and so you can use v4 for those parts of the network as long as you keep track of what the original IPv6 address of the user connection was. Um, so what we did is we used this, this um, I, I think, brilliant, because it's not my invention, this brilliant hack called address corrosion, where you take an IPv6 address, you take out the non, <clears throat> you take out the bits that the user can manipulate, so typically the last 64 bits, and you hash it into multicast and reserve space. So your application that expects a v4 address still gets a v4 address. And there's enough space there, there's 29 bits, that you can still maintain some, a, a, a reasonable level of, of reproducibility and, and logging. So you know who it was because the hash is one way, and you potentially even could brute force it if, if there was a, um, if necessary. Sometimes this isn't perfect. Some people logged into Gmail and, and the system said, your last login is from 238. blah, dot, blah, dot, blah. Um, we fixed that by saying, um, initially, we fixed that by saying your last login is unavailable. Um, but this, 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 um, this, these shim layers allow you to move forward when before all of your code has been updated to do v6 because that's a large undertaking. And, and what we've been hearing from other content providers as well is that there's, uh, for example, Facebook who recently launched their, launched their IPv6 website. Uh, what we've been hearing is that the, the amount of work to audit all the code is, is the long pole in the tent here. For them, they, they just enable v6 on their load balances and it just worked. So it took us about a year and a half to do, to get from, from a place where we started to where we had all <coughs> uh, Google services or most of them available over v v6. Let's talk about how, how we do that. Um, you'll note that um, uh, YouTube was one of the last pieces um, and that was due to hardware issues. You'll note that the, the backbone, YouTube was not back, blocked on the backbone being dual stack. We turned on YouTube and then, for other reasons, the backbone came. So you don't really necessarily need a dual stack backbone. The only thing that you need is something that's production quality. So whatever technology you do, use to do that is, is, is fine. So um, we can't enable, um, the reason why you don't do, uh, you can't, do a v6 lookup for www.google.com, you, you may know this, is that um, we can't do that or about 0.1% of users won't reach Google anymore and, and we have the data to prove that. So <clears throat> this is unacceptable to us um, and I'll talk later on about the exact, about the issues here. Um, so we, but we do it on demand. So if your DNS server is in, is in, um, is in a, uh, the whitelist, then you can get v6 records for all, all most Google pro properties. The requirements of good v6 connectivity to Google, production quality v6 networking support, and acceptable levels of user breakage, which is much harder than that sounds. So, <clears throat> again, yeah, if, you're, if your DNS server is in the, in the whitelist, you'll get uh, v6 addresses for, for most Google properties, and it'll just work. You, your traffic will just start flowing in over v6, and um, um, your users will be happy because they'll be using v6. And actually, your users will be happy because they don't know they're using v6, and, but, and, and that's the way it should be. Um, so um, we've had enthusiastic response. Um, we've got, I think, you know, maybe 100 organizations participating. A lot, most of the V6 internet that we see through other measurements is actually in the program. Um, the thing is that um, in unmanaged networks like residential ISP, support is a, is a major problem. So some, some low number of users may have broken connectivity at home, and uh, they can't get to Google, and you know what? Everything else works, so it must be a Google problem, right? So it, it, it's not that their, you know, that their home gateway is trying to do 64 behind a NAT, and that's not going to work. So from the user's perspective, Google is broken because they can go to, you know, they can go to whatever other website, and that works. So they may not even call their ISP. They'll say, "Oh, Google, Google's broken today." Um, what did we learn? Um, Testing is important. Uh, implementations mostly work, but they but they do have bugs. <clears throat> Nobody's really kicked the tires, so if, it, you know, if something's supported, it may not actually work. If you find a bug, report it and keep testing. Don't block, don't block on finding the next vendor code release because you, you, you really don't have time for that anymore. I mean, if, if, if you find one bug every three months, then um, I don't know that you're going to get this done because um, so what we did is we, we in some uh, occurrences, we worked around it in the design. We sort of put, um, we put workarounds in and we actually trialed it in production and we put it into production when we were confident that it was going to work. 
Maybe it wasn't as pretty, but it allowed us to find, it allowed us to find the other bugs, the ones that were really hard to find, like these ones. So, for example, if, um, if a firewall filter has uh, a 1-bit match in bits 32 to 64 and then a 2-bit match in bits 64 to 96, then the second term will not match on this chipset, on this family, in this version. So are you going to find that in the lab? Well, we didn't find it in the lab. So um, then the only way we found this was that the BGP pairing went down somewhere in our network. And so, yeah, good luck finding that. Um, and then race conditions between fib and rib updates, they get out of sync. Um, oh, yeah, we worked around that for v4 in this way, and we just forgot to put that in for v6. Um, again, the vendor is fixing it, but, you know, it took time. I mean, we only found this one to, after months in, in, in a large number of data centers. Um, if DAD triggers duplicate address detection triggers due to a looping interface, you have to remove the config from the interface and put it back. You can't just shut it down because that's the way it was. So, that's, again, that takes that. that the, these bugs t take time to find and fix. So, <clears throat> rather than show you some statistics about how, how IPv6 is only in France um, and, and sort of, I'd like to show you how this thing is supposed to work and how we see, see this work. So, I'm in. Um, using a, a resolver that's in the whitelist. So I basically just get, you know, v6 and v4 addresses for www.google.com. So I can just do this. Um, and I can go to, and, and there's my packets. This is a TCP dump. And, and, and then I can do, you know, I can go to maps. And I can, well, actually, I can't. But I can, like this. I can just drag the wrap around, and you'll just see the v6 packets flowing. And, and there's, the user just doesn't notice that they're using v6. So this is how we think it should work. And it's working, except for, you know, there's 1 in 10,000 users or 1 in 1,000 users that are broken. So on that note, um, so what's the problem here? Um, we're... Um, we're um, so the problem is that most applications on the client side, including web browsers, uh, are, are, are using the paradigm that was you know, written by Itogen in you know, 1998 or something. Uh, the canonical source is that and the way you do it, you, do, you call get adder info, you get a list of IP addresses, and you connect to them one by one. And you use the first one that works. And get adder info usually returns IPv6 first, so the application will try v6, and if it's not available, it'll, it'll, try, it'll fall back to v4. So the records fail and time out one by one, and then goes to v4. So how bad could that get? You'd think it would work, but it doesn't. Not, sometimes it doesn't. So there's various failure modes. You can, um, it, the, address, the failure can be local to the host, so you don't have a v6 address, you don't have a root, so you try to connect and it fails immediately. That's, that's fine. There's no problem if the application does fall back to v4. For example, if it isn't Java. And I put that down to the fact that the Java APIs were designed a long time ago before v6 was actually really being deployed. Um, but again, in most cases, this works, right? You get a, a local error, it's fast, and you just move on with life and use v4. Um, network error, routers can reply to SYN packets with unreachables, and depending on the stack, you'll either use them or you, you'll either terminate the connection or not. Um, most, up, most stacks don't actually give up on TCP connections when they get unreachables, so what other people have done in networks where there is v6, but no public v6 and no access to the real v6 internet. They send reset packets. They spoof reset packets. Um, that works better. Um, then there's black holing, MTU holds. There's, there's lots of failure scenarios. So local failure is fast. Um, with unreachables, you get a timeout that depends on the OS. In Windows, it takes 20 seconds. Uh, and, and Mac, it takes four seconds. And Linux actually honors unreachable so that it just comes back immediately. Um, MTU holes take longer. I mean, it takes with the order of seconds. Um, one thing to note that even if all the failures are fast, some applications like Internet Explorer just give up after five tries. So if you happen to have six addresses for www.google.com, then IE7 just won't work if you have broken V6. It just, it just will fail. So um, that's unexpectable, obviously. I mean, who wants to wait two minutes for the Google homepage to come up? No, not me. Um, and so we can mitigate the damage by publishing only one quad A record. We currently publish the same number of V4 and V6 records, but um, we can move that down to one, although it's still a 20-second timeout, right? Would you want a 20-second timeout every time you go to Google or every map tile you load? Probably not. So what's going wrong? So often it's due to 6 to 4, and, and, and gateways that were shipped in, in past years with token checkbox v6 support that uh, in order to, for example, uh, have some certification compliance badge on the, on, on the box, 
Um, in some cases, you can go to a hidden page to turn this off. In some cases, you can't. I know that Paul has a v6 router, and you can't turn it off, and it just breaks his v6 connectivity. Um, this will break things even if you have real v6 connectivity, because the host will choose whichever router advertisement you send out. It's, it received last. So even if you have working v6 and you have one of these boxes, your internet connection will have broken v6. You'll go, uh, at, at, at best, you'll get a latency increase. At worst, it won't work. Routers have been known to turn on v6 to 4 with private addresses. That won't work. 6 to 4 requires a public address. But implementations didn't think of that, it seems. So, um, yep, I need to get my summer picnic ticket. Um, implementations don't think of, don't think that 6 to 4 using private addresses won't work. And they just turn it on anyway. And guess that, guess what? That's never going to work. So, um, so <clears throat> there's also problems in the hosts, right? Um, hosts may prefer the 6 to 4 router over the native router, like in the case where you have two routers and one's doing 6 to 4 and one is not. Um, for example, if the 6 to 4 router just happens to send out RAs more frequently. Um, also, the host may prefer using a 6 to 4 address, so actually using a v6 connection instead of a v4 connection. That can happen if the host is not using a proper um, RFC compliant get adder info or if it's using private addresses. And this is a known issue with the, with the RSC, where if you have a V6, uh, a V6 public address from 6 to 4 and a V4 private address, the, the stack will think, oh, and this private address can't connect to a global address. Let me use V6 instead. And usually V6 uh, using 6 to 4 is not particularly reliable. And similar considerations for Torito. Um, Torito is basically a nightmare for, for short-lived connections. It's high setup times. It's, it's, it, it's got a huge matrix of times where it works, doesn't work, tries different you know, connection types, different gateways. Most implementations don't use Torito at all. And then there's always uh, host firewalls that might block ICMP, uh, ICMP v6, killing your v6 connection, um, might not understand v6 at all and just drop it. Excuse me. Um, this one's my favorite. Um, Again, don't, don't look at the MAC addresses here, please. Um, it, it's not, this is not, it, the purpose is not to say, oh, this vendor did this wrong. But, you know, what happens here is that um, there's a router on, on the home network. And this, is, this comes from a user, by the way, who said, I can't get to Google. What's the problem? And we helped, you know, we helped debug it. And, and so this gateway is sending out a router advertisement with, zero, with a zero prefix, 0000 slash 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 64. And that's not even a unicast address. It's not in unicast space. It's in reserved space. But the host happily accepts it and uses it uh, and, um, and it tries to connect. And the router says, actually, I don't really have a default route. I was telling you that I had a default route, but I don't really have one. So I'm sending you back an unreachable. And the host ignores it. So the, the host sends sin, and the router says, nope. Um, unreachable the host sends sin, and the root says unreachable. And this goes on for four seconds, and then what happens is that the host says, wait, my root is not working. Let me ping it to see if it's working. The root is working. And then the host says, okay, this root is working. Let me try the next address. So it tries to connect to the next address, and there's another four seconds. So um, this took 24 seconds, and the user was just sitting there, and the browser was spinning, and that's not what we want to see. So how do we measure this? So it's similar to what we, we've done before and what others have done before um, with a few tweaks. We're basically, we ask the uh, browser to connect to a v4-only site and a dual-stack site uh, using invisible elements on a web page. And then we, we, we measure the results. So we're using long-lived websites like YouTube and Gmail because we want to confirm that the user was, was still there after, uh, after a given time, like 30 seconds. Because we, we, we really want to make sure that the fact that the user couldn't reach a v6 website was not due to the fact that he disconnected between the two measurements, but due to the fact that he actually couldn't get to the v6 website. After 30 seconds, the user was still there, and he still hadn't clocked in over uh, to a dual stack website. So, it's, so he has some issue that's breaking connectivity. We use JavaScript to make multiple requests for the same session, and we, uh, that allows us to do other measurements like uh, <clears throat> MTU measurements and, uh, and, and measurements with glue records. Um, there's various other websites that can do this. If, for example, if you go to test-apv6.com, you can actually test your own v6 connection. Um, and we have a sentinel after a given time, again, to, um, to catch the case where a user disconnects between requests. 
And we use one-time host names uh, so that we can uniquely identify multiple requests. And then we also find out if, if the browser actually made a Quad A request. Um, we might be able to see if some <clears throat> home gateway takes 30 seconds or times out uh, quad, a, uh, quad A questions. And it also it will prevent the browser from caching the JavaScript so we can change the measurement code. So we have a reasonable data set. We have about 10 million samples a day, and this is all depends on how, ma how, you know, how many times we decide to, to hand out the measurement code. We only have web requests at the moment. We're still analyzing the data. Um, the, one point is that the daily numbers are stable. So at, at this point, we, we, we have reasonable confidence that these numbers are actually what we're going to see. Um, v4 also has uh, non-zero failure, right? But, but, the, but in our measurements, at least, there's a clear separation about v4 failure rates and, v, and dual stack and v6 failure rates. So we know that this problem exists. We have reliable data to prove it. Um, for the entire internet, the number is, um, I'd say, unacceptably high, 0.09%. Those are the numbers for 15, about two weeks, latest two weeks. And that's basically one in 1,000 users can't get to Google anymore if we turn on v6 for the whole world. And that's unacceptable. Um, if you, the results do vary per network. If you take a large ISP, um, it's, um, this, this particular ISP is 0.064%. And that's still, if it's a 10 million user ISP, that's still 6,000 users that can't get to Google anymore. That's, that's a lot of brokenness and, and something that we're not really prepared to accept. Um, for a whitelist ISP, um, the, the spread between uh, an ISP that's already in the Google over IPv6 program that's getting v6 records for all the properties that we're measuring on, like YouTube, um, the spread is um, <clears throat> less, uh, this is actually a mistake in the slides, it's less significant. So if we, if we try to measure a whitelisted network, at the moment we can't get a clear, uh, we can't get a clear signal. We'll fix that by putting measurement on a non-whitelisted host. And for different OSs, we have different numbers. For the, for the large ISP above, if you take all the clients, again, it's 0.064%. If you take out max, it drops about uh, four or five-fold. Uh, and, and, and we suspect that that is because the RFC 3484 implementation in max does six to four before private v4. Uh, and, and I think after a, slap, a slash dot post, I think that the Apple developers are aware of this, and, and we're looking forward to a fix, because that would really improve um, the quality of service that we can provide. And, and, and again, so 0 0.014 is still in 4.9's territory, so it's not the best, but um, it's significantly better than the number above. So how do we fix this? We can fix routers, and we can't really. We can't really fix routers, because you'd have to upgrade routers. A lot of these routers in the homes aren't upgradable. Um, even if they were, the user typically doesn't know what the problem is. Oh, just Google is broken today, and uh, what are they going to do? Uh, they're going to, they might look for a firmware upgrade, but most users don't want to spend their time on this, right? So they'll just say, oh, well, let's move on. Let's go to some other website instead. Um, they might call their ISP. Uh, we have seen that they, in, in, that we have seen users not call ISPs and just mail us or just accept that it's broken. Um, so for host problems, we can work, it, work around it in individual applications like Chrome or Firefox. We can't fix IE. We can't fix Safari because they're closed source. Uh, really, what, what, what we really need here is, is, is the OSs to be a little smarter. And, and unfortunately, we have the situation where there's a lot of gear in the field. There's these thousands of users in the field that are breaking connections. And the only place to work around it is really the OS. And the OS can, you know, work around router problems, right? There's various things that we can do here. There's um, the happy eyeballs draft, Dan Wing, which is a general solution, perhaps a little more complex than, than, than we need. Um, and it has to be implemented in every application. Or there's the, the OS could be a little smarter. I mean, I know that Mac OS X is, is planning to do simultaneous um, connections to v4 and v6. And of course, that, that increases the load on the server side, right? But, you know, um, if it's only a duplicate SYN packet, that's a whole lot better than a user that can't get to you at all. So um, it, it also can't fix MPU holes, but it would significantly improve the situation. And one other thing that we've seen that Windows does is when you connect and you get a DHCP or you get an address from DHCP, it probes the network to verify if you have working connectivity. And it uses this to, to uh, pop up a helpful, you don't have real connectivity bubble. Are you behind a captive access point? Would you like to connect to the internet to figure out what's wrong and perhaps log in? And we might be able to um, extend this for, uh, so that it did v6 probing as well. Um, it could warn a user, it could even disable uh, IPv6 uh, OS-wide, right? Because if it's, you know, again, one user in 10,000, it's fine to disable IPv6 because v4 works just fine, right? So, but the fact that the user is broken doesn't allow us to use v6 because it would break the user. 
So, um, yeah, so these are the ideas that, that, that I have at the moment. Um, I think ultimately it has to be done at the OS level. Um, but I'm, I, I'd be, you know, I'd love to hear any suggestions that the floor has on this. Because this is a real problem, right? It's, the fact that we don't offer v6 on our, on our main host names is not because we can't, because we have the infrastructure to do it, but we ca and we can't because the, we'll break users and we can't do that. So with that, any ideas? <laughs> Uh, Leo Bicknell, ISC. I I'm curious about those users that break. Um, I, I know several people have done studies of that in the past, including Google. I'm curious if that is an ongoing study, and if you can tell me if the rate of, of the percentage of broken users has increased or decreased over time. It is ongoing. Uh, we currently only have, um, this is very recent, the, the data that we had, uh, um, a different type of measurement ongoing for a long time. The data there is, is a little muddier, and the semantics aren't as clear as this, uh, as the new version that we have now. Um, we're collecting, this is intended to be ongoing, and we intend to monitor the situation. We don't have any data about trends because we only have essentially a few weeks of data at the moment, and we haven't done the work to do you know, trending, but it will, we plan to do that. this one. 